Right, we're now onto the ooze system, um, which was navigable in Roman times up to reach. It was tidal all the way up there. And um, as I'd mentioned before, the ooze used to join the Nien um, till 1236, and the whole thing's been changed since the 17th century. Um, and the, as well as the middle level, I mentioned that the south level was drained by Vermudan schemes. Um, and over on the Ouse side, the first major scheme that, that drained this area was the Old Bedford River in 1637. And that gave them summer grazing, but the land still flooded in winter. Later, demand for drainage that worked all year, they built the New Bedford River, or the Hundred Foot River as it's often known, and um, created the Ouse washes in between them in 1651. And the Bedford Ouse, which you can navigate right the way up to Bedford, drains mainly via the New Bedford River, which is tidal. Um, so if you go up, even if you go up into Denver and round the Ely Ouse, round the Old West River and come out at Hermitage, you, you've then got a little bit of tidal river there up to Browns Hill Staunch, but the, the tide doesn't go up and down very much. And the Cam and the Ely Ouse flow via Denver Sluice, which we'll see later, and there's a link between them called the Old West River. So it's, it's historically was a very important navigation inland from Kings Lynn, lots of sugar beet traffic, Shell Fen worked on the waterway for a bit longer than it worked on the middle level, but now it's an important leisure boating waterway. And just to see where we are, you see the dead straight red Old Bedford River, which is a you know, statutory navigation, and the, the blue New Bedford River here, and then the Eliu's system on the right hand side with all its various tributaries, the Cam, the Lark, the Little Ouse, and the Wissy. And I mentioned that the, um, the Old Bedford River and the, the New Bedford River were built parallel with the Ouse washes in between. And this is a, um, used as a, a flood retention scheme in the same way as the, the Neen washes, um, the flood water from the Bedford Ouse can be let into the Old Bedford through Erith Sluice right at the bottom left of the corner. And the, um, the New Bedford overflows at various points over what's called the Cradge Bank into the Ouse washes and so on. Um, and it's all a very complicated system. These are Aerith sluices, which allow some of the flood water from the, um, the Bedford Ouse to go down into the old Bedford River. And there's a pumping station at Welch's Dam, which can pump water into the washes um, in order to prevent it overflowing the old Bedford. And this is the old Bedford, which is, as I say, a statutory navigation. There's a gate partway along it at Welney, which is only supposed to be closed um, when they're pumping at the pumping station, but sometimes I think it's left when it shouldn't be. So if you do go on the New Bedford, you will need to check with the Environment Agency, make sure they get the gate open. But it is quite awkward to get to, and it's got rather silted up. This is at the bottom end. And there's the access through the sluice here, through the, the old Bedford sluice. Um, get silted up by the tide and it's it's just a bit awkward altogether. So it's a bit of an adventure cruise, but um, you can do it. And members of the Peterborough branch took some boats up there in 2017 to highlight the, the problems of Welch's Dam being closed. The New Bedford's a different matter. New Bedford's not a problem really. Um, it's it's straight for a long way, but it's it's decent depth. And if you go up with the tide, which obviously is what you would do, uh, <laughs> you wouldn't go against the tide, um, then you can get up there pretty quickly. You know, that's 26 miles, but it, it'll only take you sort of four hours or so. And it's the quickest way to get up to the to head up towards the Bedford Doos. If you're doing that, always do it that way around. So you go up with the rising tide. It's always better on a tidal waterway. So if you hit the bottom, you know you're going to come off again and um, and then come back down around by the Elius rather than trying to come down the, the new Bedford on a falling tide. And that's an area of the Ouse washes being the Ouse washes. So on the left, we've got the, the New Bedford River. On the right is the Old Bedford in between the washes. And across the middle is, is the road through Welney, which floods pretty well every year. As the water is retained in the Ouse washes, then is let out um, through Wellmore Sluice, um, which is a fairly modern sluice built to be bigger than the old one so that they can get better control. 
But if you if you go up the New Bedford, maybe go up to Bedford and then come back down, as I said, it's best to come back via the Elius. So you would go in at Hermitage Lock on the West River. This is a very pretty bit of waterway. And you can go up to Cambridge. Remember that when you get up there, the top end is in the hands of the CAM commissioners. And so you either need a, a separate license or you need to get this Anglian pass. Bates Bight Lock is, is the lock that they control. Um, it's all automated. You just press a button and it goes through the whole cycle for you. But if you go up there, it's worth going into the Cambridge to loads as well. There were lots of these, well, quite a lot, um, but only three are still navigable. And they're all accessed through Upware Lock, which used to be only Fen lighter length, but because they've replaced the pointing doors by uh, guillotine gates, it's made the lock longer. And you can certainly get a 60 foot boat through there, I think probably a bit longer. And the locks usually set to operate automatically to release water, to maintain water levels. So you have to sort of cancel that, press the buttons to, to work yourself through the lock. Then you have to reset it after you've been through. So it's back into automatic mode. But once you get through there, you've got three different ways you can go. Upreach load. And this is interesting because it was a Roman port, but there's not really much to see except a sewage works. So it's probably not the, the best of the three. If you go up Boa load, that's actually quite nice when you get to the top end because there's a T-shaped junction in a village and lots of other boats and pub and whatnot. But the nicest one is Wiccan load. And you look up there and you think, hmm, can, is it navigable? You know, it's actually very deep. Don't be put off by the rushes. You can push your way through. And um, Goba have a mooring at the top. It's worth joining Goba if you're going onto the Ouse, the Great Ouse Boating Association, because as a member, you're allowed to use their moorings. And of course, moorings on rivers, as I said before, uh, tend to be in short supply. So it's definitely worth joining them. That's a Goba mooring at the top of Wiccan Fen, and you can walk up to the National Trust property and look at their thatch boat house and their little wooden windmill and so on. And it's all a very pleasant day out, really. Coming back down the cam and heading down the Elius, um, we're now heading into Ely, as you might have gathered by the cathedral in the distance, a fairly distinctive profile. Ahead is the railway bridge where um, they had a, a derailment just before the IWA's um, St. Ives Festival, uh, which closed the navigation and meant everybody coming from the rest of the system had to go up the New Bedford which is, was quite an interesting thing because it certainly established um, that it was fully navigable. Um, so when I went up there, I remember talking to, to Paul um, Grojevich at Saltus Load and saying, can you let me out as soon as possible because I want to go up the, um, the, the New Bedford. And he said, you know, it's an eek tie, don't you? I said, yeah, but I, th I think I'll be okay with my draft, you know, and what's the worst that can happen? I'll get stuck in the middle of and have to wait for 12 hours till I get water again, you know, and just look an idiot. Um, so he said, oh, well, it's an environment agency navigation, so I'll give the hermitage lockkeeper a ring. And I heard the hermitage lockkeeper say, oh, tell him he can't come. It's not navigable. It's not navigable. It's, it's a neat tide. He'll never get through. And there was absolutely no problem. Um, so the environment agency certainly used to put you off going up there. But I think since everyone had to go that way to the rally, it's probably done some good in convincing them that um, it is part of their navigable waterways and they should be encouraging people to use it with the you know proper advice because it's tidal. Coming into Ely, um, Ely is a brilliant place in the summer, well normally when we're not in lockdown and so on, um, the, the cutter in right on the waterfront there and um, the riverside's always thronging with people, there's lots of stuff to see, um, the only difficulty is sometimes gets a bit full, you might have to go a little way down to find a morning but um, it's definitely worth stopping off itself is, is magnificent and you can go right up the top of this lantern um, and get an amazing view. And then I mentioned before there are tributaries, the Lark, the Little Ooze and the Wissy, which you can go up. Um, the, the Little Ooze is also called the Brandon River because it goes to Brandon and you should be able to get to Brandon. And the environment agency thought, oh, well, if we restore the lock, or build a new lock effectively, um, just below Brandon, everybody will be able to get up to Brandon. But they built it about 12 meters long, so most narrow boats can't get through because it's not long enough. Um, it's just a little bit silly and we need to push for that to be lengthened at some stage. But lots of wildlife up there, definitely worth a, a visit if you're into to wetland wildlife. And the Wissies full of islands and surprisingly 
remote really there's a huge sugar beet factory up there um which i think is now closed but um you you, you could be miles away from anywhere on most of it and there's all these channels between the islands so that's taken us uh, round through Ely and down the Ely Ooze up the tributaries and we've now got to Denver Sluice. Denver Sluice is where um, they needed to keep the tide out if they wanted to to drain all this land so they built the new Bedford and the old Bedford but they also um, wanted to to improve drainage on the south level and um, to keep the land dry all the uh, they needed a barrier which the first one was built by Vermeuden in 1651 and it's had just tidal doors, not a lock. Um, but it was breached by a big tidal surge in 1713. So it was rebuilt by a chap called Leverley. And then it was rebuilt later on by Rennie with a proper lock, which had four pairs of pointing doors. Um, they added a big eye, as it's called in the 1920s, a guillotine gate, which could be opened to let big craft through on a level. Um, the lock was converted to guillotine gates, which actually ended up lengthening it because instead of having to have space for four pairs of pointing doors you, you just had the guillotine gates and um, so now the barrage is made up of the big eye the little eyes and the lock as we'll see yeah um, this is the big eye on the left this is no longer in service the lock on the right does work with two lots of guillotine gates the little eyes in the middle which have supposedly been refurbished but the trouble is they silt up um, but one, one point here, in the distance, beyond that next crane, you can see Salter's Load. So if, if you just want to come across and go into the lock, um, then you, you need to um, obviously stay close to that bank in the deep water. Otherwise, you run aground on this, this mud bank. And of course, it's high tide. You can't see any of this. So the really key thing here is there is a lock keeper at Denver make sure you follow the advice of the lock keeper at Denver. It doesn't guarantee you won't get caught, but um, you, <laughs> you, you're much less likely to. But, and people have got caught out. So um, unless you're fancying doing a quick bit of, bit of blacking without paying for a dry dock, then um, do try and follow the where the lock keeper tells you to go. Now, the Denver Sluice was just the Denver Sluice at one time, but now it's the Denver Complex. And it really is pretty complex. Um, because of flooding in Ely, um, because flood water couldn't get away, even with the sluice there, um, you can keep the tide out. But obviously, if there's high tide, the water won't run away uh, from, from the inside of it, from the landward side. So they built the relief channel in 1964, which is huge capacity channel, an enormously wide channel. So the idea is that that would accept the flood water during high tide and then it could run out at low tide. And they built a cutoff channel to collect flood water from the Lark and the Little Ouse and the Wissy as well. That was all a flood defence scheme. Then someone thought, oh, they sheltered water in Essex and um, the cutoff channel sort of heads in Essex direction. We could make that work in the opposite direction in dry periods and then send the water across, transfer it to the river store and then from there to the backwater. And um, that's what happens. So the Ely Ouse to Essex transfer scheme, the water can come from uh, Denver Sluice in Norfolk and end up in Dagenham. Um, eventually they decided, you know, after 30 years, they thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to get boats down the relief channel? So they built a lock. Um, there are some problems here. River flows for a long time, I think were preferentially sent to the relief channel because they, they had a modern source that they could control properly um, instead of the you know, 1834 little eyes, which were forever silting up. And that led to siltation in the tidal river. So they've now refurbished the little eyes and it's supposed to be better. But as you see, this still does build up silt just below the, the barrage. And this is showing where these various sluices are. So you've got the, um, the Denver sluice where the cross is, and you've got the AG Wright sluice that controls the letting flood water out. You've got a little sluice here to let a bit of water down the relief channel when they're not using it, just to stop it going stagnant. Then you've got another to impound the cutoff channel and another sluice to send water backwards up the cutoff channel. And then in the middle of it, you've got the new lock. So it's all, great fun it's worth uh, they do have an exhibition there uh visitor center and um it's worth um 
having a look at it and not shown on this map um actually but oh it is shown sorry yes but it's just in as pub um the jennings arms here i believe it's still owned by the environment agency and i think it's one of two pubs they own I'm not sure why they own it but it's definitely worth a visit as well and the aerial shot there, interesting, you can see the tidal river coming up and going up the 100 foot towards the bottom left, how, um, how silty it is compared with all the freshwater bits. And um, it's not surprising you get such silt buildup. The, um, as I say, the, there is a facility to transfer water to Essex. It comes off the cutoff channel down a huge shaft and a long underground tunnel to Kennet pumping station, which is just near Newmarket. And then it's pumped into the Stoa and from there into the Blackwater and Banff and so on. So there's, there's water moved around all over the place. And where the cutoff channel crosses the tributaries, it goes underneath them in a siphon. And then there's a, a sort of side channel that can divert flows into the cutoff channel during flood periods. So when you're coming down, this is on the Little Ooze. I'm heading for the, the gates on the left, which is the open. Um, that's the, the normal route of the river, but in flood conditions, those gates can be closed or partially closed and the gates on the right open to let the water all run away into the um, cutoff channel instead of flooding Ely. And that's the cutoff channel. So that's the Ouse system. Um, main rivers are deep and wide, Denver locks manned, but siltation is a problem, so do talk to the lock keeper. Um, the 100 foot is easily navigable, whatever the environment agency say. Um, obviously, it's a tidal river, so you know, behave as you would on a tidal river. Um, the Cambridge to Lodes are very worth visiting, particularly Wick and Fen. Um, the new lock to relief channel is great, just beware of the wall chains. Um, you do need an EA key and the who's windless. And here, the new Emory guide is currently still being finished, um, but will be out soon. And the thing to remember over there, you'll probably find people talking about pointing doors and slackers instead of gates and paddles. Finally, we'll go over to the Witham for a quick final quarter of an hour. Um, the Witham comes down from Lincoln, which is just off the map at the top left, and, and into the corner of the wash in, the, in what's called the Haven. And um, to the north, well, to north and south, there are fens. To the south, there's the South 40 foot drain or the Black Sluice navigation, as it's sometimes called, which has recently become accessible again. And to the north, there are with the navigable drains in the East Fen and the West Fen. So let's look at the Witham first, just very briefly. I mean, it was tidal to Fiskerton. It was made navigable up to Lincoln by the Romans. So it was uh, yeah, a very ancient navigation. And the Romans built a connection through to the tramp called the Fosdyke, which is obviously one of the oldest canals in the country. They also built this car dike, which I think I mentioned before, but we don't know why they built the car dike. Um, High Bridge, otherwise known as the Glory Hole, is Norman. It's the oldest bridge in England with uh, with buildings. Um, originally, when, sorry, it was the constructor is Norman. Um, high tides were always a risk, and so in the same way they put Denver sluice in, they put a sluice at Boston as long ago as 1142. But the Grand Sluice that's there today was built in 1766, along the same sort of time as as the other drainage works were all going on. And the Witham, because the fens on both sides have been drained and so they've sunk and sunk and sunk, uh, the Witham is now a high level carrier. So in a lot of places, the, the Witham is actually embanked above the level of the surrounding land. So the, the streams that drain into it um, have pointing doors on them, which close if the level of the Witham comes up. And uh, a lot of the areas are pumped up into the Witham. But several of the connecting drains were made navigable and the South 40 foot was reopened, the entrance lock was reopened in 2009. Um, the South Delft may have been made navigable, archaeological um, excavation has shown um, evidence of shipyards up there, so it presumably was navigable. And then the River Slee was canalised to Sleaford and the Bain was the basis of the Horncastle Canal up to Horncastle. At the moment, they're proposing a flood barrier at Boston. Uh, this is to keep out tidal surges, you know, a new version of, of the Grand Sluice and, uh, and of um, 
the Denver Sluice, I suppose, the same function. Um, IWA has been very involved in trying to persuade them to operate it so that it maintains water within the haven. Um, at the moment, they don't want to do that. They just want to close it when there's danger of a tidal surge. But um, I, the local branch is working hard on it. Um, so just a quick look on the Witham. This is Highbridge or the Glory Hole. Um, good place to more quite near the center of town, although the cathedral um, is right up at the top of a very steep road called Steep Hill. Um, but at least it's downhill on the way back to the boat. And then at the other end, um, downstream through a couple, only a couple of locks, um, and you eventually get to Boston, the sluice with doors pointing both ways. Um, to keep the tide out. And that's at low tide below it. What we would like is for them to retain water in there with this new barrage so that you could navigate on a non-tidal waterway down to, down to the Black Sluice Lock. The local fishing fleet uses the river here, um, mainly fishing for mussels, uh, mainly in the wash. In fact, the, the Kings Lynn fishermen say the wash fishermen never go out of the wash because they get lost if they did. Um, I think that's just banter. Um, I've done a bit of consulting with these fishermen. It's quite interesting. Um, further down, we've got the railway bridge. This is the railway branch to the docks, which is still in use occasionally, uh, but it's normally left open for river traffic. So the Witham, it's a CRT navigation. You can get to it from the Trent, so you don't need to go around, around the wash. Um, High Bridge is the limiting point. Um, there are moorings in Lincoln, there are pontoon moorings at various places. And the moorings in Boston on the river are only available in summer because in winter when you get high river flows, when, when the tide's in and the water can't get out, um, the, um, the levels go up and down quite a lot. Um, you can lock into the tideway at Grand Sluice if you're less than 55 feet long, or if you're longer, you have to pass through on a level. Again, you need to book in advance as with most tidal locks. And just a point that as on the lower trend, VHF is obligatory in the Haven. Um, people with canal boats sometimes forget these things. And off to the north, we've got the East Fen and the West Fen with a ridge in the middle with this red line on and the map to the right. Um, those, the, those are drains managed by the Environment Agency. They're actually called Main River. Um, but to the west, the drains in the West Fen are the Witham navigable drains. To the east, there used to be a whole set of drains as well, but the access through East Fen Lock uh, at Cowbridge there is um, no longer available. Apparently the lock's still there and filled with gravel, so I'm told but um, they've perpetrated a golf course on top of it. And there's a tee on, on top of it. So we need to move the golfers and dig the lock out. Um, as I keep saying, the drainage has shrunk the peaks, the land's below the with them. So you lock down into the navigable drains. Um, the drains have been navigated for a long time. So this area, the earliest drains would date back to the 13th century. And it's the same as the middle level, levels kept low in winter and high in summer. Um, and the water, uh, the drainage actually flows under the, the Stonebridge drain, which is the one on the ridge that I mentioned, um, from the West Fen to the East Fen and out at Hobble Pumping Station. But as far as navigation concerned, you lock up into the Stonebridge drain and it would be nice if you could lock down on the other side into the East Fen, but you can't. And they can put water in from the Witham uh, as well if they need it. So this is a slightly better map. You see there are lots of bridges. The main problem with the, with the navigable drains is that some of the routes, um, particularly Castle Dyke at the bottom here and so on, have some very low bridges. So do check that before you, um, before you set off. So you lock down through Anson Scout Lock um, and you can um, go up Cowbridge Lock to get onto these drains on the, the ridge. Hagnaby Lock, which is at the top end of one of those drains, is, is now discontinued, but you can sail straight through it. Um, and Laid Bank Lock in the East Fen is, um, is blocked by a pumping station. And these are all looked after by the Witham Ford District Internal Drainage Board, apart from these central ridge drains. So that's where you go down. That's my boat coming back up again, um, down there. And then you can go across and up Cowbridge Lock, which is a very sort of primitive little thing. The bottom gates just have one paddle and you just pull them up with a chain. Um, the top gate, you need to see our T key to unlock the padlock and it's just a very simple guillotine. 
And once you get through there, you can actually moor um, by by Cambridge Lock. It's quite a secure place, I think, to moor. I uh, fluffed my boat there before now. And you get onto the Stonebridge drain here, and to the right is, is the Maud Foster drain takes you down into into the middle of Boston. And those are the best moorings, I think. I think they're still okay. Um, the local branch has done work over the years trying to, to maintain them. But you can potter around for hours, um, mostly quite straight. Um, and at every junction you can you can wind. It took me about two hours to turn around there at the entrance to Bolingbroke Drain. But you know, if you want a bit of something different, it's it's worth a look. And some of it is actually quite scenic. That's on the East Fen. That's the, the old lock at Laid Bank, but it's had a pumping station built right across the top of it, which is rather unfortunate. Um, this is probably repeating a few things, but low bridges are the main restriction. Winding points are limited and CRT key needed. And then Finally, I think this is the last one we're going up, we'll look at Kaimo or the Sleaford navigation. That was navigable back to the time of Edward III and fell into decay. Then it was opened as a sort of proper navigation with proper locks in 1794 and was quite successful. But then eventually the railway came to Sleaford, more, more than one railway came to Sleaford, and um, that uh, caused a decline in the waterway. And it was abandoned in 1878, apart from the bottom six and a half miles. Um, Kime Lower Lot was converted to a sluice, but has since been restored by the local restoration trust. Um, and Cobbler's Lock upstream, the next lock upstream has been partially restored. The chamber has been restored by Waterway Recovery Group and others. But um, the trouble is restoration further upstream will require some uh, agreements with the Environment Agency about flood levels because obviously development has happened um, since then. And um, if you had the same places in the floodplain as in the floodplain then you'd flood lots of properties so there's a, a discussion to be had about how to manage levels but you can go up as far as cobbler's lock you come in from the with them i mentioned pointing doors there um, you might find they're partly closed and you might have to poke them with a stick um, just to to get them to open properly um, and if it's if the forecast is heavy rain then just be aware you might be stuck in here for a bit till the with them goes back down again but um it's it's fairly straightforward, um, typical fen landscape um, up through the bottom lot, kind of a lot, whatever you want to call it. There, the Environment Agency own the top guillotine gate, but the, the Restoration Trust own the bottom gates. Um, it's only open in the summer because in winter it's used for flood uh, management. And some of it's this tall bank, so the only way to see is to stand and steer with your foot, really. Oh my goodness, I still had some brown hair in those days. Well, there we are. Um, the, the main obstacle for getting up there is, is Hapney Hatch Bridge, which is only two meters high. So do be aware of that. You may need to take your chimney off and everything. And then up to Cobbler's Lock, which as I say, the chamber's been restored. It just needs new gates, but we did an agreement about water management upstream. Um, oh, there's, you need a CRT key for Kime Lower Lock as well. Um, you can wind in South Kime. They've put some new moorings in, in South Kime as well, uh, which is the main village you go through, and you can wind at, at Cobbler's Lock. But watch out for the blanket weed. You need to kick it off your propeller at regular intervals if you go up there in the summer. Finally, what about the future? Well, there's, there's all sorts of things. Well, your stam needs it's not really restoring, it should be repaired because it shouldn't have been closed in the first place. But anyway, Welch's Dam needs sorting out the slee we just talked about, this potential for restoration of at least some of the Horncastle navigation. The East Fen navigations would just need the lock digging out. That's all be very simple. Um, the well end up to Stamford, um, the NAR uh, from Kings Lynn, which could be linked in with um, connecting to the bottom end of the relief channel to make a non-tidal route down to Kingsland. And then the little ooze in the lock could be extended to their original places and the other loads that aren't navigable could be made navigable. So there's, there's lots of potential there as marked in, in yellow on that map. Um, and some things are happening. So the Witham to Neen link, uh, it's originally marketed by the Environment Agency as the Fens Waterway Link, now being promoted as the Boston to Peterborough Wetland Corridor, corridor sorry, by Lincolnshire Council 
IWA and the Environment Agency. Um, the, the first bit of that Black Sluice Lock has been reopened so you can get into Black Sluice from Boston. Um, and the, the restoration of that drain is, is ongoing. Sorry, I've called it two different names there, haven't I? Black Sluice and the South 44 do the same thing. Um, just confuse you. Um, and the feasibility study and how to link that to the River Glen has been completed. Uh, once that can be linked, then you can go by the Glen um, and the well end through Spalding. And then we need to get the, the rest of this wetland corridor built to link it through to Peterborough, possibly by the car dike. Other things that have happened, the new lock opened in, in the, to the relief channel and the potential for extending the relief channel. Um, and there's potential for linking the old Bedford to Well Creek, uh, which would be very easy, as I'll show you. Um, and that would avoid having to go in and out through the, the difficult old Bedford sluice. And then, of course, there's the idea of the link between the canal system and the fens via Bedford with the Bed Bedford to Milton Keynes link. So all sorts of potential. And I mentioned about the old Bedford, um, where the little blue rectangle is there. Um, the old Bedford and Well Creek are literally a lock's length apart and there's nothing much between them. There's a track you might need to maintain over a swing bridge and that's about it. So that sounds like a, a job for work. I'm sure they could build a new lock there. So let's keep pushing these things. And this is the, the progress so far that's been made on the, the um, Boston to Peterborough link in that the, the lock, a new lock was built essentially. Uh, you could say the lock's been restored to allow you into the Black Zoo strain. And Fulney Lock in, um, in Spalding is, is navigable, but it's difficult because the Environment Agency have taken a lot of the paddles off and it really is operated as tidal doors more or less but um, the local branch do periodically uh, organize campaign cruises and the environment agency do come out and work the lock for you um, and there's a, there's a local boat that goes through it occasionally but that would be part of the link through uh, Spalding which is a very attractive and then probably via the car dike um, to get down to Peterborough I mentioned the new lock to the relief channel. Um, this is mechanized, you push the buttons to open the gates and so on. Um, all, all very satisfactory, really. And that's it. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, John. Hopefully you can all hear me, yes. Um, thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Um, Hopefully it will encourage a few people to uh, have a go and uh, visit the area. Uh, we've got a couple of questions, John. Um, first question from David, are the plans to restore navigation into Oundle Basin? Um, I'm presuming by this he means the, there's a little basin just by the bridge um, at Oundle. Um, I mean, I'm not, it's a long time since I went past it and had a look at it. Um, I wasn't aware that it had sort of formally been closed. I think it's just a matter of it's rather silted up. Um, and people do, as far as I know, sometimes try and get in there. Uh, but I, I, I honestly don't know the latest state. Um, but that's something maybe um, we can raise with, um, it'll be Peterborough branch. So that, that's something I'll take away and we'll, um, we'll try and encourage them to to do something about it because I, I say I think it's just a matter of it being silted up rather than rather than any major works needed. Okay and um, from another David, a different David, is the cutoff channel navigable? No, no it's not. No you can't you can't get into it. I mean you probably um, you probably could get into it when the if the sluice was open you know in theory but it's um, uh, the, the impounding sluice is open. I suppose it, there'd be nothing to stop you going up a little way, but it's not it's not properly navigable. I don't know how far you'd get, and I don't think the Environment Agency would be too keen on you going up through that particular sluice because it's not designed for navigation. Okay, uh, I can just see one or two coming in the chat box rather than the Q and A. Uh, is there any info on time needed from 
Northampton to dog re canoeing stroke rowing? Mm, I, I've never done it rowing. I mean, I used to, <clears throat> when I had a girlfriend in Peterborough, I used to go up there quite often, <laughs> up and down quite often. Um, I used to reckon I could get um, from the canal at Northampton to Peterborough in three days, but that was sort of, you know, that was cracking on a bit. And if you want a relaxing cruise, you need to allow probably four. Uh, but that was with, um, you know, that was with a motorboat. Um, if you were rowing, well, it depends what you're rowing in. I mean, if you're rowing in a, a racing skiff, obviously you do it a lot quicker. Um, if you're rowing in some heavy tub thing, um, <laughs> it would stay long. So it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, I think canoeing, you do it in much the same sort of time. So three or four days, probably from the canal to Peterborough. Well, canoeing, you do it a bit quicker, maybe down, down the Northampton Arm, if you're portage around the locks. I mean, the Northampton Arm itself, you know, the first five miles takes you three or four hours. So that's um, quite a slow bit, but then you speed up on the river, obviously. Mm. Another interesting one here. How can you best work with the EA? <laughs> well, um, I mean, what we find with the EA is that, uh, you know, this is, I suppose, what IWA typically finds with the EA. Um, you know, a lot of the local people are, are very enthusiastic and helpful. Um, and I mean, we had a very good relationship with the river manager on the on the Neen, um, Sue Kant, who's just retired. Um, so we've now got sort of built up a relationship with a new person. Um, but the local people are generally great. But the trouble is the Environment Agency is continuously having its funding cut. It's now really not got enough funding to do its pollution control um, stuff. It's, it's being really hammered for, you know, not prosecuting farmers and things like this, and not doing anything about water companies that are polluting. And um, Navigation, unfortunately, is a long way down its priority list. So all we can do is keep banging on about um, better funding from the government. And um, we, this is something that we raise through the um, all party um, parliamentary waterways group from time to time. And we will keep on at, at DEFRA. But um, that's the problem is the Environment Agency hasn't got any money. How realistic, this is from Nick. How realistic is the Nen to Witham link for completion in the next few years? Uh, I don't think it'll be in the next few years. I mean, it's. I think it's perfectly feasible for the um, the South Forty Foot to to be done. You know, maybe within the next five years or something. I mean, there's there's a pumping station partway along it, which would need a new lock, and then they've got to do a link to the Glen, so that that'll need a lock as well. Uh, I presume, and well, yes, it's bound to. Uh, and then that would get you through onto the Glen. You can then go on existing waterways and through Fulney Lock and up into Spalding and so on. And so you, you, you get to Deeping or somewhere, which isn't very far from Peterborough. But then that next bit would really be very much building a new waterway where you know one hasn't been before. So that's a much more difficult proposition to, to get funding for. I um, mean, it, it wouldn't have to have loads of locks. Um, you know, in theory, it it might not be too difficult to do. It depends how many um, road bridges you have to do on main roads. And that has been there's been a business case prepared um, for the Boston to Peterborough Wetland Corridor, Corridor just recently, and that has actually sort of come up with a, a definite proposed route and identified the things that are needed. Um, but at the moment, there isn't really a, a timetable for that bit. It's, it's not going to be the next few years. You know, I would, it would be good if it happened in the next 10. OK, we, we're still carrying lots of uh, viewers and we had um, over 100 all the way through that. So it's an excellent turnout. Are there any more questions from anyone? We've uh, come to the end of those that have been posted. Just anyone got anything to say for a moment? One from me, uh, you mentioned at the end the um, Bedford and Milton Keynes link. Any mm -hmm. um, real chance of that coming off? Um, I'm not very closely in touch with it. I mean, they, um, they're still, you know, it's still in the local plan and the local the local authorities recognise, you know, recognise it as a, a valid scheme. Um, but it's, it's just a matter of funding it and uh, I'm afraid I don't know what the latest situation is on, on funding for that. I mean, it, it'll have to be 
lots of it will have to be funded by development. That's the only way, realistically, it's going to happen uh, through Section 106 or whatever. Okay, any oh, somebody put their name, but uh, in the question, but uh, no question. Can they improve the height of the bridge into Bedford from Phil? Um, I, I I don't know what's the I mean the lowest bridge in Bedford I thought was the railway bridge, is it? And I don't I don't think you'd have much um, much hope of getting that altered. Um, to be honest, it's it's so long since I actually went up to Bedford by boat, I can't remember um, the bridge situation, I'm afraid. Okay. Anyone else have anything to say? You get lots of lots of thanks, uh, John. Well, well deserved anyway. So uh, many, many people saying uh, a wealth of knowledge, very interesting, very informative. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, I hope, hope people enjoyed it and I hope it'll encourage some more people to, to poke their way down there. I mean, you know, the Fens, Fens are a curious place and it's not sort of the scenery and whatnot isn't for everybody, but it's definitely worth a visit at least once if you've got a boat. Yeah. And lurking in the background, helping us out uh, technically is Gemma Bolton from IWA. Um, my thanks to Gemma. Uh, yes, thank you, Gemma. You've set this all up and... Uh, it's run very, very well. So if we have no more questions and I can't see any more coming in, um, I don't have the button to press to end it, but I'm sure Gemma does. But uh, <laughs> thank you again, John. And uh, I yeah. wish we could all stand up and clap, but uh, I'm sure individually we are. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Goodbye, everybody.